Hey everybody, we are Martin, Robert, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hey, welcome back everybody. This is Snakes and Otters, episode 13. Uh, super excited to have you with us. Uh, I just poured myself a fresh glass of That's Woodford right. Reserve. And you are? I am Martin. I am Francis. And I'm Robert. All right, thank you, brother. So... Guys. Sibling, you're quite welcome. Strength and honor. Strength and honor, that's right. Um, the Judean People's Front uh, salute we give here visually. You can't see it, but that's what we're doing. The People's Front of Judea. Oh, that's right. The People's Front of Judea. That's right. Make sure we get that right. So, guys, I've been reading Agincourt. Agincourt, or however you pronounce it, by Juliet Barker. And it's a recent book, all right? Uh, fairly recent, yes. And this should have been a book that I would have been writing in my wheelhouse. I mean, Agincourt is a great story. Absolutely. We it's love Henry V. It. It's, it's bravery. It's That's chivalry. A, it's a, it's the ultimate underdog beating the big guy story. Yeah, exactly. It, we've we've watched everything. the movies. We've discussed the Shakespeare play. It's a, it's a, a wonderful moment. Yeah, we're a little Anglo-centric. That's okay. That's okay. Given the color of our skin, that's pretty pretty, that's pretty standard. Correct, that's yeah. right. well, well, we could be French. We're not French, but we could be French. Well, we're not cheese-eating surrender monkeys. So that's we're exactly not right. That from there. I was kind of hoping that I would tee that up. That's right. Well, but, we're, not, uh, we're also not pasty-faced tea drinkers, so, you know. That's right. Anyway. <laughs> um, I'm not quite finished with it, but I have to say I'm disappointed in the book. And that's rare for me with a history book. Amen. You've, I mean, you've spoken to us about this, and it's I'm stunned. Yeah, really dry am. academic history books, I still usually even enjoy them. Yeah. Uh, of course, obviously, with the more narrative history books, love those. Yeah. This one, I just don't... It's, she just goes down too many rabbit holes. Uh, she spends five pages discussing... Um, calculating dates in medieval calendars. It's like, look, I, I, I don't care if Henry left Harfleur on the 6th, 8th, 9th, 10th, or 11th. Just pick one and keep the story going. And what's bugging me here is this book has terrific reviews. There's a Bernard Cornwell blurb on the cover about how wonderful it is. Yeah, that's right. And we are big fans of Bernard Cornwell. Very, very much so. We've read, I've read all of his Sharps books. Uh, and many of the, just about anything the guy writes, we've all I think several of us have read the Saxon books. I've read some of the Saxon books. That's right, I'm they're not, good. They're I good. have not finished them all because it's kind of like fine wine or fine bourbon. You don't want to drink it all at one time. You want to work your way through them. Anything Bernard Cornwell will do is worth some time. So his imprimatur, if it were, oh, is, word, yes. is big is big for us. Would this be a bad time to point out that I have not read a single word the man has that, written? Uh, that's correct. That's right. <laughs> you, you know that. And we know that. That's correct. It's uh, not because I don't want to. It's just never gotten around to Well, it. you've seen the Sharp series with oh, yeah, Sean yeah, Bean. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. And that's, and that's pretty much a serious adaptation of his books. As a general, if you've watched the whole series... No, you, no, I've just seen a bit. Here. You've seen a, a bit of it. Yeah, a bit. Sorry. A bit. A bit. But right. it's it's pretty close yeah. on that. And uh, he's just damn good. He, he masters what you'll find as the battle scene mm -hmm. uh, in most of his books. He's very good with that. And so his... his as I said, imprimatur yeah, his means up. a lot. Yeah, means a th lot here. So, and also, in fairness, he's also worked on English history very, very well. He's yeah. not done this. He's done around this time period. He's done. Uh, I think it was 1452. He's done a book on the Battle of Cressy, which is very, very good. Extremely yeah. good. It's a little earlier than this. He's not done this. He well, he did do Agincourt. He did as in court. Yeah. If you depend, if you read the English or the American version, it's spelled differently. Uh, I've not read it yet. It's on my shelf, though. So he's tackled this battle directly, and his is a narrative story, as it always is. It's now, of course, he creates his own characters that he puts in the moment. It's yeah. kind of like Thank You, the movie Titanic. It's done that ever since then. It wasn't the first, but well, it's uh, many Jeff Shara and his father. That's correct. That's their approach. That's right. Yeah. You create well with Buster Cor uh, Buster Kilrain. You, right. You, yeah. you create your own a fictional character that's everywhere, at, in a, in a given moment, and sees everything. Voice. It's the author's voice, the people's voice, the reader's voice. Yeah. 
he does a damn good job. And so for him to say this is good carries weight. And yet, you th- dare you say it sucks? I don't know about sucks, but it's just it's just so broken up. Is it the rabbit holes that disturb you the most, or is it the when she's away from the rabbit holes? Is it okay? That's a good question. I think it's the rabbit holes. But even when she climbs out, it seems like she has a hard time picking up momentum because she's right back in another one. Um, it's the excessiveness of rabbit holes. So. That's my question for you guys, because again, all three of us read tons and tons and tons of history. What makes for a good history book? Am I just too enamored of the pop history? Uh, am I expecting every history book to be David McCullough? And, or Bernard Cornwell. Yeah, and, and, and that's not a dig on uh, David McCullough. I love his stuff. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's, but is that all there is? And I think you've hit on something that's very human here. Most of us do not want all these damn footnotes citing your sources for obvious shit. So we say. That's a. Who's the audience? Because if this book is written for the same people that read David McCullough, then maybe she's missing the mark. However, if it's being written for a more academic audience, then maybe all those sidebars are important to those people. But, you know, here's the thing. I think you're on to something, because it is an academic treatise. Yeah. But usually, I don't mind those. That's right. Adrian Goldsworthy oh, he's very good. has a very academic tone to his His Punic history. Wars is an excellent book, and yes, it is exactly right. He's very academic, but he does not doesn't distract. Yeah, I mean, the the things that should be sidebars in this are right in the middle of the narrative, and it's just like, look, I don't care how much Archer's got paid. It's a question of timing, and maybe that's an appendix issue. Yes, yes. It's... How is it germane to the story? Yeah. (laughs) Maybe that's the thing, is maybe I can't decide what audience I'm in. Well, now, there's something to be said for that, too, because, as we talked about a little bit pre-show... You know, there are three major parts, I think, to any history book, uh, at the very least. There's the dates, the facts, the figures. That's right. How much did the archers get paid? Uh, there's the narrative. That's right. There's the, you know, what happened, where did it happen, and what was the sequence of events. Yeah. And then there's the, what did all that crap mean? So, and the academic can... The meta-narrative, as you were. Yes, yes. yes. Right. Now, the academic audience will probably be more interested in the facts and figures and the you know the the sequence of events at least in today's modern historical treatise a thousand years ago history might not have been written that way two thousand years ago it definitely wasn't written that way pardon uh, but for popular consumption you know for guys that are armchair historians yeah. just like to read history you know, maybe the narrative... We would probably qualify. Which That's we would right. qualify, That's yeah. Right. But I, I think mean, we, we don't do it professionally. We don't write about it. No, but I think we represent a huge swath of the population that's buying these books that needs to be satisfied. We're not, well, I don't know if we represent a huge swath. We're in that swath, but honestly, I think we're a little more unique than that. <laughs> Perhaps. So that's right. right. I'm totally we're, we're, about that. We're consumers of that product, Yes, but we're very... Oh, what's the right word? We're somewhat knowledgeable. We're uh, we are big picture people. Yeah, we want to see how it all fits together. That's right? correct. Yes. Now that's great. The details are great, but only to the point that they support the entire meta narrative. There's that word again. Yeah. So for us, the meaning is extremely important. Yeah. Okay, where are you going? So is the story because the story is what where the meaning comes out. Yeah. That's right. You, you got to tell me something. And then you got to prove something to me. The proof is simply a matter of being consistent, though. We don't need all the citations. No. But we need to make sure that, you, that you're not making it up as you go along. I am all for an author saying, you know, according to such and such, this. Or, I don't mind footnotes. Right. I skip yeah, most yes, of them. Yes. That's right. But yes. if it's a point that has a footnote that I'm particularly interested in, I will read those footnotes. Yeah, that is correct. But I, we, we'll exactly. the option, You've got to have but we don't want the distraction. 
You right. gotta say, I mean, you where's know, the recording, difference? I'm getting this from this source. Right. I love that. I love. That I think that's that, what you're talking about. That's included. The, what's the difference between a footnote and a distraction? <laughs> yeah. Five well, pages. Yeah, five oh, that's, pages. That's, that's right. Freaking different. I yeah, mean, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's like, so that's a. It's, that whole thing should have been a footnote of. There's lots of different ways to calculate dates, and from medieval calendars. My best guess is Henry left Harfleur on October eighth, mm -hmm. and go on. Yeah. So and, you know, guessing if, is fine as long as you say it's a guess. If this yeah. is meant for an academic audience, if this is truly an academic treatise, because if you look at it, this is what a Penguin Press is that the. No, yeah. Penguin is it? Uh, Back Ray Books. Back Ray. Okay. Yeah, because uh, what four hundred pages, something like that, three four hundred. It's like a lot of those historical books with the black background and you know medieval t type it, it of picture. Looks like, it looks like a penguin book. You're right. So that's why um, I thought it was penguin. I mean, but we are at three hundred and sixty some pages without the notes. And here's the. Thing. Well, that's a good fifty and, yeah, pages the right notes, there. The yeah. notes are fifty pages, every yeah, bit of yeah. that. if not more. Which is and fine. I get it. You, you have you have to, to do that. that. Yeah, but it doesn't take you out of the narrative to do so. It's there if you wish. Well, wish it. I submit that this book, given the cover, and everything else to me that looks like this is this is not meant for the same people that david mccullough writes for yeah oh that you're exactly right on that so one. Or bernard cornwell right that's right so this is a different i'm guessing that you stumbled on a book that maybe you would not normally have read primarily because of what it was about yeah. um because yeah i mean i did I, the reason I you bought it i did pick it up in in like a little store half price type store oh uh, see now i might have picked it up for that reason too i mean you know yeah, I'm, I'm just all you needed was the word was like, court and I'm like, oh well, that's a great story. I gotta get this. Oh, it's got a Bernard Cornwall, Cornwall quote on it. Of yeah. course, I'm gonna buy but it. But Bernard Cornwell, of course, if you had seen his book Agincourt, it would have been a very different experience. You would have had the narrative of the story that you're looking for. That really that would, one have I would have nailed you. Known as a fiction, though. That's correct. I would. But give Bernard Cornwell his due. He does not. Yeah. He fictionalizes a character. But the moments and everything he does yeah. in it is exactly but on that's you on know that is a difference between you and me. You love historical novels. That's correct. But I only so only, big for him only because I do only by Shara. certain folks. Yeah, Shara is but Cornwell's the same way. In many respects, he does he does not take very many liberties. And if he does, he, he mentions it, it's very, very minor and yeah. it's only just for a narrative reason. And he speaks he always has this historical note at the end that explains I, I fudged this one only because we didn't know any better. Hmm. It's really only that he doesn't come up with. He doesn't do things on his own for his own reasons. Yeah. yeah, it's only when there's ambiguity that he does that, and that's one of the reasons he's such an ex excellent historical novelist. Uh, and Sharon K. Penryn is very similar to this too, where they're going to give you the truth. They're just going to put it in a narrative format. Charles is exact as a very yeah, good yeah. example too. Char is great they, in that he's they, just like that. He he tells don't the mess, history. They don't muck with it. But he's going to have his his characters, uh, and partially in a way that makes part of what makes his books good history too, because mm -hmm. he doesn't make up stuff for a whole lot. Because obviously he he does a lot of dialogue and what happens. Yeah, I mean a lot of dialogue has to be put in character. Well, that's real right. Historical because, figures. Matter. That's right. right. But you know, you, but it's all consistent with the truths as we know them. And right. It, and a, sometimes it's going to be direct quotes because we right. have letters and what have you depending right. on the era. Exactly. And uh, it's like the Titanic thing where you you create two characters that are everywhere. And you have them to see the entire scope. Well, yeah, uh, the only only thing I would say about that is that, well, two things. One, you've dropped a um, a love story into the middle of the which story about the Titanic, right. totally different. That's which correct. Which is not the same thing. And two, why the hell didn't she let him on that door? There was enough room for both of them. The amen to that. That's sorry. correct. Sorry, sorry. I sorry. pounded the table. You pounded the table. Uh, sorry. How about I just... a different a different example of a film that drops. Uh, fictionalized characters into real events. Give me it. Midway. Oh yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, because there's years a earlier. New, there's a new Midway coming. And I tell you what, that looks good. Have you looks seen good. the previews? Correct. Yeah, this is where we're recording this in the middle of 2019. It's due f what in November of 2019. Yeah, but uh, it, it, it's sacrilege. It was well, a Chuck I knew movie. you were going to say that. I knew you were going to go there. It's a Chuck Heston movie. You can't screw with it. Let's watch well, it first and see. I gotta say, it looks like it looks the good. best presentation of the Battle of Pearl Harbor you'll ever see because it actually starts with that. Apparently. That's correct, and that's yeah. one of the things in Midway, the movie, and we're going off on a tangent here. 
uh, Midway the movie didn't really do. It presumes that well, you, you had know Torah, all Torah, that. Torah for that. Whether well, it came correct. later or earlier, I don't remember. That's, that's, well, you're right. It, it, it was around the same As time. an aside for the listener, the film Midway, 1976. 76, that's right. Oh, was it that late? Yeah, yeah. It, it was actually wow, late. It was earlier. Weston, and it picks up about the Battle of Coral Sea somewhere in there. Yeah, and P- Pearl Harbor is done. Yeah, and, it's, and it's tells the story, the important story of the Battle of Midway, through Chuck Heston's character, who is fictionalized, as is his son. That's but right. a lot of the rest of the characters... But everybody else is real. Is you know, Down to Just the about. aviators and everything. That's right. Everything else is exactly right. So they they were one of the... They probably weren't the first, but they were damn well close to it. Yeah. That This well, is not a new concept. No, but we've at, known it only through specific moments, like Midway or Titanic, or certain moments that came into our understanding of narrativeness film wise yeah. they realized oh yeah this character doesn't exist but they're yeah, letting right. they're letting the, us be it's the, voice our, of the audience. it's the voice of the audience and that works yeah. it works it, very well way it works for, because Chuck's character as as an officer has a reason to be everywhere. Has a reason to be everywhere. He's important to the staff with Nimitz. Right. So he's in on all the planning, and he's a flyer. So he gets to go out, and his son is dating a Japanese girl that went from California to Hawaii, which gave him a reason for a human interest story instead of just a yeah. let's regurgitate the battle. It's not a documentary. Okay. So is that the way to tell history then? It's there the historical is, novel, the historical... I, 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 I like that. I, I there is no one way to tell it, though. Well, that's correct. There's so, no, for instance, just as a, a bring this... Maybe this is kind of a mix of all of these genres, uh, in, uh, sub-genres of, of history. Have either of you read anything by Eric Larson? Not the comic book artist, but the author. The other, no, I have not. No, I don't think so, but I've heard some of these... Uh, okay. Some of the names of his titles. So, right? Devil in the White City is one. That's the first one I read. And that is about... Um, one of the first mass murderers in American history. It's like the American Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Okay. And it's all during the context of the World's Fair in Chicago. And so that's so he's kind of telling the story of both the World's Fair and this guy. But you don't realize it until about halfway through this isn't a novel. He's telling a narrative, but he's not making up words and putting it in anybody's mouth. Anytime somebody says something. It's because they we've actually got a documentary trail. Ah, so yes. Man for All Seasons is exactly the same way. The movie and the play and the book, uh, it's all about most of the words that go into Moore's mouth and those that he has conversations with are his. Okay, well, I mean, this is not most. This is all. Well, it's, I mean, there's yeah, it's none. right. It's, yeah, it, it's, so, the mm. narratives are only structured around the words. Mm-hmm. And the truths that so are given. So there's that one. There's uh, one about the Lusitania. And I forget what that one is called off the top of my head. Uh, but you could look it up. Uh, then there's one uh, which I thought was really interesting because it was World War II. It was about the ambassador in Germany prior to World War II. Hmm. When the Nazis are in power and taking over and about to unleash hell across the continent of Europe. And the only thing I thought was odd about it was there was this side story about the daughter of the ambassador and her very sexual affair with the Russian or with a Russian from their embassy. It's kind of not germane. It's kind of germane in that it's part of the family. Yeah. But still, even so, all of the book, you know, it's told in narrative chronological order. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it reads like a novel, but isn't really. Shane K. Penman is famous for doing this in her stories of Henry II, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Richard III, and all those folks. It's all done narrative, but everything is built around the stuff that they already we already know that happened. So what you're and saying it works here, well. What you're saying here then is whether you do it in a fictionalized version or telling it as a straight academic, uh, I, I with all did the it in a pop history terminology. As long as you're one accurate, yep, and two, tell a connected narrative. That's right. It's going to work. Amen. I think so. I think that all of the facts and figures, the dates and all of that stuff, it's fine. To a certain degree, it's important, but with the exception of the very close knit academic historical. You know, historian world. Mm. 
that segment is the least important uh, because that you've definitely got to have right and cite and it's got to be there when you write your doctoral thesis That's right. or your master's. So in many respects, the fictionality of something is not a problem if you've done your homework and yes. you do not go outside of that. You're allowed to add in your character or characters if you need to. Con Igledon did a really great, and I've talked to you guys about this before, a four-series book on the War of the Roses. And yeah. it is unbelievably awesome. It's I've got the hardback books upstairs on my shelf, and they are worth a read. They really are. And he, care, he creates, as you saw, talked about, a couple of characters that carry through the narrative, but all the rest of them are actual historical folks. And it's exactly as it happens. And he lays it all out in chronological fashion as a narrative. And it works. It works really well. And if you read that, then you have the background and understanding and the visualization of these people as people. Edward IV, you know him as a guy. He's not some sort of histor historical figure. Uh, even though Derry Brewer, who is a character that he creates and puts into this, he's like the spy master. He... he carries through the narrative he's there and he's cool and he's wonderful but he's there observing things and interacting with the folks he's not the narrative he's not the main character all the other characters are going on out around so him. I, again I think it all goes back to audience yeah. you know I think it really does because yeah you know so for Francis and I you know we will often read theology which I know it's not going to be a whole lot on your bookshelf. Right. But there's also two strains of those kind of books. Mm -hmm. So there are the, there's the popular theology. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, for instance. Yeah, he's very good. Right? Does that move more into like a self-help kind of no, 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 direction? No, no, no. Okay. no it's no. more of conversion. No, you're thinking more of um, uh, Rick Warren and his, uh, what's the, purpose-driven life. Uh, okay. That sort of thing. This is true theology. Uh, and it's you know he discusses theological yeah, the topics. He, he's a theologian by trade, but he also speaks about the concept of conversion and belief and all those things that go with. So there's a popular aspect, and then there's an intellectual scholastic aspect. Well, he's got aspect. two sets of things that he writes. Though. That's right. Yeah. So he has his pop books that are meant for the popular, and by popular I mean the you know the population at large, not you know those that are. Uh, popular, I don't, you know that are. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Is like I was are, saying about yes, you know, all of us, as, right. us as consumers of history books, we're probably not the typical consumer of a history book. We're not the armchair. We're a little more serious than that. That's right. But at the same time, we still like that stuff. But I would so think that we same, probably have a tendency to. We would love to read the narrative first. Because some of these things are enormously complex. You read the War of the Roses. It is in you know, how many players you got going on here. Over uh, how much time do you have? It's very, yeah, You've it's, got it's to really get that down first. So reading a narrative, fictionalized version is a great way to get your arms around it, and then from there. And I think that's what the book that you're talking about here is. If you understand Shakespeare's Henry V, if you read a little bit about a narrative, say Bernard Cornwell, because he did he did at court. Then you go to this book here, you're prepped, you're prepared. And maybe that's what... I that shouldn't have to read two other books to enjoy this book, You shouldn't book, have to. You shouldn't have to. However, if it's meant for an academic audience, they already know that stuff. That's right. So that's, the other, that's where I was going to go with the other half of somebody like a Scott Hahn. Yes, go ahead. Is that, so he's got the, the books that he writes for popular consumption. But he also writes books meant for the scholarly field. That's right. They are much thicker and... The you can actually read his his uh, doctoral thesis. Uh, I downloaded it years ago. I started reading. It's like wow, this is a lot more dense than his usual stuff. Right. You know, he doesn't have puns in the name of his title. The title of his chapters, like he does in the more popularly oriented books. So he's got two different. And he, the fact that he can straddle both worlds is a testament to the man's intellect. Well, there's yeah. a question because as a general rule, you get one. Or you get the other, or you get the other, but I mean, you rarely get both. Yeah, I, the same thing with somebody like Adrian Goldsworthy versus Tom Holland. Oh, absolutely, that's a very good I mean, dichotomy I, I here because love Goldsworthy. He acts and and he writes. <laughs> that's right. Sorry, not, sorry, not, not Spooderman. Yeah, yeah that's Tom right. Holland. For yeah, for those of you that don't know, I'm not talking about the teenage actor that plays Spider-Man. Actually, he's like twenty something. 
That's is right, it? but he, he looks he, very. He young. looks young. and he plays it well. Don't get but me wrong. But he was probably a teenager when he started. I bet because well, now he's been in he's five than. MCU movies now. He, he's well, that's great. And yeah, as we record this, uh, Spider Man Far From Home has really um, what a month. Yeah, it's been, been out right. about twenty that's days, right. twenty five. So days. and he's he's kind of come. This is his what fourth or fifth? He said yeah. fifth. He says his fifth fifth one. Civil War, Civil, Civil War, War, two of his own, and two Avengers movies. That's right, exactly yeah. right. So oh, this would be six then. Oh no, he's two of his own. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. that's right, two of his own. Yeah, and he counted all that. So I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the English author Tom Holland. I love his stuff. He's got a new one coming out this fall. Uh, he plays cricket and tweets frequently about cricket. Uh, yeah, let's talk to the stuff we're interested in. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's done he's done Rubicon and yes. he, he's been done Roman history, which we will eventually get to. Yeah, and it's very, history, very well. That's right. Yeah, and then Christian history. One of his books, The Forge of Christendom, is uh, the year one thousand and yeah, everybody you're thinks far more the world's expert on end. his work than, than uh, we yeah, are. I love him. But I've read Adrian Goldsworthy and he is excellent. His Punic yeah. Wars is still it's dense, though. You've got to have some and idea. that one, as you talked about, that one is more of a doctoral thesis. It is correct. That was like his first and, publication. But it's not inaccessible. Yeah. Because I'm not... He gets know. more accessible as it goes on. His, his uh, Anthony and Cleopatra is very good. That's right. I love them both. I'm a little bit more of Holland right. because he is a touch more of a storyteller. A touch more That's right. of a narrative person than Goldsworthy. See, and that I think is the key. No matter, I think even, that's exactly right. We've kind no of no matter seen. what we say about who the audience is, what style of writing, you know, which of those three subgenres are you focusing on? Ultimately, I think your your book of history is going to fail if you ignore the fact. You know, granted, this only works in English, but that it is his story. That's right. You yeah. know. Yeah, it doesn't work any other well, language it, except ours. Right. <laughs> I mean, the thing that I always do about history is I've, I've thought about why I'm so engaged in it a lot. And I'm a nerd. We all are. And I don't understand Testify, people. Brother. Testify. <laughs> okay. I don't understand people, but reading history gives me a chance to understand people. A good history book oh, yes. or a good biography isn't so much about the events, it's about the decisions people make. And the motivations that yes. brought them there. Motivation Why do they is make huge. these decisions? We look back on it as like, well, yeah, of course it's stupid to start a war over shooting Franz Ferdinand. But you have to understand, you know, look at Where the people, they were who they were, and why, who why they were. They, that's, a, that's a very good way of phrasing it. Why are they making these decisions? And that helps me understand There are certain my world blind me. spots that we have as human beings at different times and places. And there, are, and we, in many respects, we're prisoners of our own understanding and our lack thereof. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that Franz Ferdinand, shooting Franz Ferdinand is a great one. That Well, he didn't think so. But well, yes. he didn't think so. <laughs> But the, the understanding, this was almost inevitable. Yeah. Because well, we should be able to figure this out. And so that's the thing about, you know, why that's, you know, you, what you talk about, those, two of those three things, those sub that's what's important to us. The the story, what happened, but then the why. Because the why. that's, to the us, why. that's what really makes it and interesting. Because yes, we're all about as snakes and otters. It's, it's a very why? unsatisfying history book if you don't show me something about their time that led to these decisions That's right. that they made. Where's the human motivation? Yeah. Yeah, Ultimately, it's about the human and I'll, experience. I'll admit that between rabbit holes, Barker is doing that some here in Agincourt. So it's not a complete disaster book. Right. Um, she does delve into who Henry V was and talks about his piousness. Yeah. Because he does become a very pious person. He's considered to be one of the greatest of English kings. Yeah. And, he, and it's he not does just become, because of the victory. She it's talks a lot it. about chivalry, which is very important. It's very much a part of their motivations. And all of their actions are based off chivalry. If she had stuck to that, this would be a good book. So, you know, one of the things that, as we're talking about, that struck me is that, and something that, that uh, Francis said, um, and I don't point that out because you don't say things that. Strike me, you know, I just you happen to be the one that said it. Hey, when brilliance happens, it happens. That's right. right. Um, we are those blind spots you talked about. Yeah. We take so much for granted, okay, because it's either common knowledge, yeah, 
or it's just been presented as, well, this is just the way things are. Yeah. And you don't give it another thought, right. whether it's common knowledge or not. So right. it's kind of like you accept certain premises by well, default. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they are um, often that are often rooted in time and social construction. Yes, often they are wrong, and that's they are absolutely important. wrong so yes. often. And that's kind of where we're yes. going with this. Yes, and that's why when we talk about World War One, and I talked about my three books, it's because some are military history, but some are social history. That's right, and that's where we find that where we are today as people, as human beings, we look back and say, you guys were absolutely stupid to not see this. And yet but, they are prisoners of their time and their authentic understanding of time. Is it that they were just that ignorant? Not stupid, but ignorant. Well, let me give you a counterpoint. In a hundred years, somebody's going to look back at us and say, how could you have been so stupid to build and use atomic weapons? If we haven't already blown up the entire world anyway. Yeah. Assuming that we survive, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, now, it may be that we are still in that mutually assured destruction kind of world, but still, you know, I mean, even now, people kind of ask that question, but... Right, and it's a very important part of, of uh, 20th century um, scholarship. Yeah, that's right, of yeah. looking at Truman and trying to figure out why did he make that decision? That's right. What was he being told? Well, we ourselves, at the age that we are, are products of the Cold War. We grew up with the yes. understanding of the bomb. And with the, the day after still scares the absolute dog shit out of me, uh, seeing that movie. And I've even talked about that on many occasions, that it's, it's, it's bad stuff. But that's the era that we grew up in. And, how, and that we lived in, and in some cases, created the world around us, yeah. around... How much of that is what we're talking about here in all of these cases? History is only as good as where we are at the moment it's written. <laughs> no, that's, there's, well, there's some truth to that. Uh, it's not always the case that the closer it's written to the, the event itself... Oh, not at all. That's right. But also, it, it's there's also a corollary to that. Just because you're farther away doesn't mean it gets any better. Because right. the farther away you we get, s- we still have our you own tend to revise it through your own lens. Through our own through lens. The, the, the more... Yes different your culture is than the culture of the event that you're talking about Mm -hmm. the more likely you are to to interpret that event through your own lens that's right we're always going to focus on that yes so currently we have all of these uh civil war era statues or not civil war era but about civil war figures because most of them weren't put up until the early 1900s yes uh they're being torn down because they represent an evil period in our time to the people who put them up it may or may not, because we don't truly know. Right, they're dead. It may or may not have been about, we need to put blacks back in slavery. Or it may truly have been, I'm proud of my heritage. Honestly, I think it was probably a little bit of both. That's right, I think it's it, complex. It is a very fondness for antebellum world. Yes. Well, there's a, there's the whole lost cause uh, oh, myth, too. We could, we do, we could do a whole... We could do six episodes on absolutely, lost cause. So yeah, yeah. We don't want to so, go there. you know, it's... We interpret everything through our current lens, and to a degree, yes, we should. Because that's right. if something is evil, it's evil, and if it's evil now, it was evil then. That's right. There is value to putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Yes, I mean, it's, it, these things can go too far, and it can be. Uh, well, look, that wasn't a Confederate general. You're talking about pulling a statue down. You know, read a little actual history and know who that person actually was. But it is valuable to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think about, okay, I'm a minority and I'm walking past the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest every day. Yeah. That, that has one, to be That dog doesn't hunt, as we used so, to say. Well, guys, uh, uh, terrific. Absolutely terrific. You definitely... So a good history stuff. book, then, is something that tells a story and then tells you what the story means. Yes. Or helps you figure out even better helps you figure like out better. what the story means yeah that's right yeah it has and, to have a why and you cannot go down too many rabbit holes or you lose your audience yeah losing the momentum losing the narrative flow yeah. even historians need a good editor yeah now i don't know how many books this woman that we've been talking about wrote before this but one of the things that i've noticed is that when you become an author and you become well yes. known enough mm-hmm. They stop editing. They stop. Oh, that's editing. right. Nobody and, edits Stephen King. That's right. And we how do you know? Because before, his yeah. books are too freaking long. That's right. Well, they may not be too long because I, I love Stephen King. I think his craft is phenomenal. He is one of the better true writers. He may not tell a story that I like every time, 
But how he puts a story together to me is phenomenal. That's right. He's very he, constructionist. He's got it down. But does that mean every word he writes should be in that damn book? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. J.K. Rowling is another one. The first Harry Potter book is like what, two hundred fifty pages or something? Yeah, we'll it's like an inch that. thick. The final book is like four inches thick. That's right. And that's you know something had to put by in that two time, movies. It's by that time nobody wants to touch it, right? Because it's become a sacred cow. Exactly. So yeah. you know, maybe, you know, his, historians need a good editor. Historians too. need an editor. Yeah. And I think maybe that's the answer to the question yeah. you premised at the very beginning. And again, this this may be a doctoral thing. This may be that initial book. And a good editor could adapt that accordingly. Yeah. Well, that so depends. I mean, you know, should. some things you can't because should. of what they are. That's correct. If it's a doctoral should. thesis, eh, you, you know, depending on... I mean, if you're going to publish it, you know, somebody's paying for that. Yeah. yeah. I would like to think that they could have done it a little bit. Yeah. That's true. And it, a simple structural revision, as you indicated, putting some of these things into appendices... And to Foot end notes, notes and yes. uh, I'm, yeah, I'm maybe ass- you do a chapter on what the society was like. Well, the the, you know, the, the Gilead how the book dates talked, are messed up. Yes, how much people make. That's what's right. it take to be a an archer? Well, you know, the the Gilliam book we talk about for War of the Roses was very good at that. They yes. did the first three or four episodes. Yes, and your minor chapters. book is like that too, where there's like a background and then a chapter. That's right. Was, that, so. They lay it out. The first four chapters is laid out all that background stuff. And then you start the narrative. So not only can we be writers, we can be editors. That sounds like I've a I've always thought my, my job should be a book editor. Well, there you go. I should have well, been a book editor. Brilliance is where it is, brothers. Yeah. That's right. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. Yeah.